it seems like Aubameyang struggled with the culture that Arteta was trying to harvest a, a little bit at Arsenal. I mean, all the top clubs have this culture. So you think of Manchester City, Liverpool, there's definitely cultures that are developing, well, cultures that are there at those football clubs. I think there is one developing at Arsenal. Arteta talks quite heavily about the non-negotiables. What do, what do you guys think of that? What do you think the culture is that Arteta is trying to get going at Arsenal? Well, I think Aubameyang's problem was that he was the captain. And so was expected to be kind of a manifestation of that culture, of those ideals. And he fell short in Arteta's estimation. Whether that needed to result in him being booted out of the club, I guess is another question. But I think clearly Arteta discipline is something that's really important to him. You know, we've seen him fall out with players previously, likes of Meza Ozil, who we've mentioned, Matteo Ginduzi is another. Um there have been some question marks over his handling of William Saliba, sending him out on loan rather than integrating him in the first team squad. You know, Arteta is clearly a character who he speaks about non-negotiables. I mean, I think he draws quite a hard line. I think he is quite a, a disciplinary figure. And it's such a change to what we're accustomed to at Arsenal. You know, Arsene Wenger was a guy who I think was occasionally accused of indulging players. People spoke about London Colney being a bit of a crash, you know, where players could get away with things. And, you know, Unai Emery came in, tried to change that to an extent, didn't really have the authority, the gravitas to enforce that on the squad. Arteta, I think, clearly has kind of seen that and tried to draw very hard lines where he can, very clear boundaries. Um, it's not to everybody's taste. And I mean, players as well as fans. And, you know, there are players who who struggle in that environment. Aubameyang would be one. I, I guess the case that Arteta would make is that this is a, a cultural change that needed to happen at Arsenal. Sure. That they, they needed to have more rigour, more discipline uh, if they were going to get where they needed to go. And it's interesting, isn't it? He's built a squad around younger players, you know, players who maybe are, I don't know, more impressionable or more easier to handle in these circumstances. And I think when you've done that, it's all the more essential that the experienced players are setting the right example. And perhaps that's why if Aubameyang wasn't, Arteta felt he had to go. Would you go along with that, Art? Yeah, I think one thing that I, I think Mikel Arteta said, I can't remember when it was, but he spoke about cleaning Arsenal in a sense, in terms of just cleaning the culture. And one thing I remember from his first press conference was him talking about a tree. And if the tree shakes, then you can't actually um, move forward properly. I've butchered the way he actually said Managers it. Managers just but, love those metaphors, yeah. don't they? I just Sometimes I don't know where they're going with it, but I yeah. feel like they love to come up with yeah. something that sounds vaguely clever. So yeah. they're always looking, always searching. But I think I know what he means yeah. by that. Yeah, and I think that's where you've seen him just almost have his stance and he's not going to move away from that. Um, like James, I see people's reasoning in terms of that being a bit too much. Um, he is still, what, he's only two and a half years into his managerial career. And I do think as time goes on, he probably will need to develop those more softer managerial skills to um, get the best of his top players. But you can see in terms of the recruitment, especially the, the goal is to get players who buy into his thinking and then and then you can build from there so I think it definitely is something where you can see the issues but over time you, you'd hope they just smooth out a little bit more and be a bit less drastic than they have been in in the past two and a half years and just to come back to Dan's original question a way back about you know if Aubameyang was scoring goals would this have happened perhaps not Perhaps not. You know, what we don't know is the degree to which Arteta was willing to indulge Aubameyang or other players when they were really delivering, when they were really performing. I guess when that stops, when you're not doing that and you're not meeting the basic criteria, clearly that's where his line in the sand is. Um, but it is interesting because I think different managers would handle this differently. And I think, as Art says, maybe even in a few years' time, when he is a more experienced manager, Arteta might reflect on this incident and think, could I have done things another way? I don't know. He doesn't seem like the character to admit that he was wrong, so maybe not, but we have to... Uh, yeah, it's a possibility. 
James, I wanted to ask you, because I saw a clip of you on the on the Arsenal Athletic podcast talking about how um, Arsenal had tried to move away from having this kind of all-powerful one figure at the club. Yeah. But perhaps the Aubameyang uh, situation shows that they might be moving back towards having an individual who is obviously quite central to what happens at the club. So could you just kind of explain a little bit more of your thoughts on that and also whether that's a good or a bad thing for Arsenal? Yeah, well, I, I think uh, Arsenal were defined, the modern Arsenal was defined by that period under Arsene Wenger where he was effectively running the club. You know, it felt like he was a chief executive, a technical director and a head coach all in one. Arsenal really kind of diversified their executive strategy after that, went with the kind of head of football and a technical director and a head coach. And Arteta's original job was head coach. Uh, but after he won the FA Cup and had that really impressive first six months, he was promoted to manager. And I think since then, his influence within the club has continued to grow. I mean, Arsenal are keen to emphasise that it is a team effort, you know, that the likes of Edu and uh, Director of Football Operations, Richard Garlick and the board and the ownership are all important voices at the table. And I don't doubt that. But, you know, you listen to Arteta in any press conference and you hear stories about him and you realise that his voice is maybe loudest. You know, he is a very... Uh, charismatic uh, leadership figure and I think there is a huge amount of faith in him at Arsenal and consequently he wields a lot of power um, so I, I do think Arsenal I would I'd probably be exaggerating if I said they've come full circle I don't think that's true but I think clearly you know he is far more than just a coach uh, he's up there with Eddie on a level pegging really as a technical director and has a lot of influence over all the technical decisions within the club. Now, a lot of managers, a lot of fans would say that's as it should be. Um, but I don't think he would have been backed on this Aubameyang issue unless his standing was very, very high. Uh, you know, ultimately, he's won this battle against the highest paid, biggest star in the club. It doesn't always go that way for managers. And for Arteta to have come out of this situation seemingly getting what he wants. I mean, I don't know whether he'd want a Bermian to go, but so, surely uh, he's had a big say in what's happened. I think tells you about, about the position he holds at Arsenal. Um, which and is I suppose really when you look at a situation like Everton had with, with Luca Dean, where yeah. Benitez won and then ends up losing his job anyway, it shows that when you try and sort of well, uh, Dan's giving a fist pump because it was Villa's game, that situation. But it is interesting how you know, often when these situations happen, both parties can end up losing anyway. But that's true. But I think what's interesting about that is that Benitez was already on quite precarious ground at that yeah, point. Yeah, exactly. And I don't have any sense that Arteta is on particularly precarious grounds. Of course, mm. if the rest of the season is a disaster and yeah, Arsenal, yeah. you know, languish in lower reaches of mid table, blah, 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 you know, it, it could be. And certainly the Aubameyang saga will be a kind of defining thing i think for arteta if he comes through this and manages to succeed with this team in relative terms he'll look much stronger if arsenal fail and they struggle to score goals this abandoning situation is going to be brought up time and time and time and time yeah. again but i do think that the fact that um the club have effectively backed his disciplinary measures here shows you that right now he's on a pretty strong footing yeah ah uh, because Obviously, James talks of the Veng, the Vengiers, the tail end of the Vengiers, where he's almost doing too much at the football club. Did he perhaps then go too far the other way with Emery in charge? And now they kind of have found a middle ground and got it right? Yeah, I'm not sure if I'd say they've got it 100% right just yet. Okay. Because there is still a sense of, I think especially from the outside, it could still be too much of um, just going the complete opposite way. Of Arsene Wenger. I do think Emery was probably too much too soon. Um, you probably needed a bit more of a slow burn into it because you saw, I think, I think it was in Ula Emery's second game in charge in the Premier League where he brought off Mesut Ozil after, I think, maybe it was an hour. And you could see even then it just didn't sit right um, in terms of the, the harshness of those decisions. And then when you move into Arteta, I guess you, you, 
you're a bit more prepared for it, but it still feels uh, a long way away from the Arsenal of old um, or the recent Arsenal, <laughs> I should say, because you've got the George Graham years before that. Um, but I, I do still think there is a, a way to go before you find, uh, I guess, the, 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 happy, the happy middle ground be, uh, between setting your standards and also not 100% appeasing those players, but just helping them through those situations a bit more um, because you can't go through situations every, every season where you have to terminate uh, a contract of a high play, play ha, high paid player um, just to keep things moving. You, that isn't great for business as, as, as well as football. And I think um, you, you will need to develop a, a bit more uh, rather than just having almost situations crop up every season where you are paying players to leave, basically. Um, but is that what Arteta's moving away from a little bit? Because they almost win, like, I don't know how much Lacazette's on, but when Lacazette <laughs> probably goes in the summer, they almost won't have that that star man, that high paid player anymore. So they, they because of the way they've built and the way they've done transfer business, arguably they won't ever find themselves in that position again. It's true, but they also will need senior players who they can depend mm. on. You can't... Well, so I suppose is, is, is Pepe also looking at the next guy on the conveyor belt of high paid players that did, might be on I the way I did forget out. Pepe had existed, to be fair. When I, <laughs> so when I, was that I feel like, it, you know, there's, I suppose the situation that, uh, not to get too big a picture, but I suppose the situation in football at the moment is that there's always going to be a player that might not work out at a club, but a club puts and gambles a lot on them as the one that's going to be their saviour almost. And I suppose the failing at Arsenal has been perhaps there's a few too many of those guys who are near that sort of, you know, with Abamiem, the sort of leader of that, and whether they need to move to a less sort of like changing room hierarchy in the kind of financial respect. I don't know. Yeah, yeah I, think that's, I think that's, sorry, Art. I was just going to say, I think that's what they've done in terms of the recruitment strategy last summer it was a much more, um, how can I put it? I guess the distribution of wages changed. Yeah. You know, they've moved on a lot of players on very high salaries, brought in people on slightly more even, egalitarian, slightly lower wages in a lot of instances. Um, and and that will happen uh, when you have younger players anyway, won't it? Is they're always going to ask for a bit less. That's, a de- <laughs> that's organic to a degree. What will be interesting is, obviously, they still need a striker and you know, they're going to have to put a lot of eggs, financial eggs in a basket to get somebody of the requisite quality. Um, so then you run the risk of ending up in a situation like this again, where you've you've spent a lot of money on a player and you kind of need it to work to an extent. I think the age profile will be key. You know, I think Arsenal signed a Bamiang for 60 odd million quid in 2018. And I think when it got to August 2020, it's easy to say this with hindsight now, but maybe the right thing to do was sell him at that point with a year to go on his contract. He'd made a fantastic contribution to the club, helped them win a trophy, scored a lot of goals, but was coming, you know, he was the wrong side of 30 and past his prime. And Arsenal chose to keep him on, on huge money, and thus ruled out really getting any kind of transfer fee, have had ultimately to pay him off and were left with a player who was no longer likely to be at his best. I appreciate it you'd say all this down the line when you've seen it play out how it has, but maybe what Arsenal needed to do then was be bolder and be braver and make the choice to sell him and, and bring in a younger replacement that would protect them better financially. Um, and maybe that will be the lesson of all this. I certainly hope so. 